But then the kids who grow up in this super comfortable, super safe, super industrialized, commercialized world, they have this huge question of, okay, well, what's this all for? Because they didn't go through the hard times. We're going to devote our energies to sports and gardening, all the cultural pursuits as far as they're concerned. In fact, we're going to put the goons to sleep. Meanwhile, we dig. Greetings and welcome to The Anadromist. This is Burn Power, your friendly anadromist, swimming against the stream. Well, today we have another in our serious... <laughs> today we have another in our series of anadromist dialogues. And today, interesting guy named Sam goes by the name of Sam Adams, but Adams is not his last name. And he was very curious to talk with me about the Jesus movement uh, for personal reasons. Uh, the group that he grew up in made a lot of hay during the Jesus people era. And he was curious as to what that was really about. So to the best of my knowledge, being fortunately near the center of everything, I gave him my opinion. And if you are interested in this rather obscure bit of American Christian history from the late 1960s, early 1970s, I think you might find this interesting as well. Uh, Sam introduces this uh, because he's also put this on his channel, but I let him put it up there for a week first uh, just to give him, you know, whatever he's going to get from it. And then it's time for you folks to join in on the dialogue. Without any further ado, Sam, take it away. Um, all right. Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Sam. I am here with a very exciting guest. I'm here with Burn Power. Um, Burn is the host of a YouTube called, uh, a YouTube channel called The Anadromist. I believe I got that correctly. Anadromist uh, comes from, um, uh, it's, it's about salmon, right? It's swimming upstream against the current. It means, essentially, it's swimming upstream against the current, but it, it, it describes the life cycle. So you go out into the, the oceans to, uh, to live and everything, and then you come back home at the end. You spawn and die. I yeah, love it. Yeah, <laughs> I, I feel a little anadromistic myself. I live in the same hometown uh, that I grew up in. Where is that? Uh, it's it's a I won't mention its name, but it's a suburb of Chicago, um, and so I, I grew up here, and then you know, I went away to college in New York. I had a job in Wisconsin, and I then lived in Boston and stuff like that. And the, it wasn't you know I wasn't against the idea of returning home, but it wasn't really a goal or a priority necessarily per se. Um, but then it, it worked out, and uh, I moved back to Chicago. I lived downtown with my wife for a little while. And now I'm uh, back in the same suburb <laughs> where I was born. The, the salmon made its way back to the same stream uh, that uh, that I was born in. In this case, the north branch of the Chicago River is uh, just uh, near my house. Right, right. Yeah, um, I think that um, uh, one thing you should mention is that I'm not in America. I am. Yes. I am. Well, you're in Georgia, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Yeah, I'm living in Tbilisi, Georgia, which is not a little town between Macon and Athens. You know, it's it's uh, Tbilisi it's the is Caucasus the Caucasus Mountains. Yes, uh, exactly. Kind of in between Russia and Turkey and Armenia and those places. Yes, yes, it's a very different world. I've been here for over two years now, and I'm enjoying it, even in these strange times. Um, and I feel like I've settled in. I uh, recently did this whole uh, fundraising drive on GoFundMe, which is still slightly active. Someone gave me $100 yesterday, which is wonderful, uh, to get my, my stuff here. Uh, I've got a container full of library 
back in Alaska, which is sitting in a storage unit. And I have to get back there and uh, stuff the container and send it all here. And one of the things I need to do before I do that is buy a, a cheap house here. So I have a permanent place to live. The nice thing is I can spend between $35,000 and $50,000 and have a three-bedroom house. Oh, that is pretty nice. That yeah. Is, uh, that's one, of it, one advantage of the other Georgia. Yes. Well, I feel like I've gone back to the 1950s here, but fortunately I get a little bit of money from the year 2021, so it goes quite far. <laughs> so. uh, that, that, that's cool. Um, Byrne and I met, I guess, through Paul Vanderclay. Um, we, we both uh, were on his channel. Um, I don't know if you had started your YouTube channel before you talked with Paul or after. Here's the I, secret. I, I, just before and I did before. and I did that on purpose I had actually started one channel back uh, around 2012 uh, and this is a channel which is still there it's called gravity from above and it's my channel that I made so that because I wrote all these essays about my journeys into European puppetry which is a very long story which we probably won't get into today but I figured I needed a channel to have videos to reference. Um, so I started that channel. And then I started noticing I had videos there that had like 20, 30, 40,000 hits. I had a, a, a lecture on the meaning of puppetry there that had uh, 25,000 hits on it. I'm sitting there going, hmm. So meanwhile, I, w I had come here and I realized I'd come here to Georgia to help start a uh, puppet and doll museum. And then I discovered, mm, shall we say, the bureaucracy and the lack of money. And so I, I said to myself, well, you know, let me start two more channels. And the first one would be The Anadromist, and the next one would be uh, Georgian Crossroads, which is m for my observations on Georgia. So now I have three channels. Uh, two of them have over a thousand uh, subscribers, which is nice. Um, but I, so I started the anadromist. I put one or two videos on there. And then I said, well, this guy, Paul does things. Let me get in touch with him and, uh, see if he is interested in talking to me. And I knew that if I did that, I would get a few people who would wander over. You know, I wasn't thinking of it in a mercenary way because I figured just watching Paul talk, I said, yeah, I'll get along with this guy. He's pretty cool. And I had been uh, found him because I had been observing the, the Peterson phenomenon, although not in the same way most people were. I wasn't watching the Peterson phenomenon going like, oh my goodness, I'd never heard these things. We need to hear this. I was watching it going like, yeah, that's what I was doing in the 1980s. <laughs> you know, so, uh, uh, but yeah. Uh, so uh, that kind of helped kick it off and then it slowly grew and it's still slowly growing. But there's a nice little community of people, although community is probably the wrong word, a cohort, a contingent, something like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and I was watching one of your videos yesterday. You you commented that um, com if you think that this is a community, if you think an online thing is community, you're deceiving yourself. You're probably just a isolated person in some geographic locale or something well, like that. And that comes from very, very practical uh, reality. Uh, for one thing, I lived uh, in several Jesus people communes in the early 70s. For a second thing, I lived at Labrie in Switzerland for a year and then I've gone back to visit every now and then uh, uh, ever since then. And then I lived in a place in which there is hardly any community at all besides the California suburbs. Um, uh, that was New York City. And then I moved to Alaska, which was all about community. So for me, the, the notion of community is not an abstraction. So when people talk about, you know, the, the gaming community or the black community, I'm just going like, you know, what are you talking about? You might as well be talking about the global community. It means nothing at that point. You just stretch the word. It broke. It's gone. Fine. Use it. You know, but it's not really a thing. <laughs> it's just an abstraction at that point. Right. So, so I think anyone listening who didn't know your story already will pick up on the fact that you're one of the most interesting men in the world. I feel like you, 
<laughs> trust me, trust me on this. Trust me on this. I've met people far more interesting. But and so I yeah, I will admit I've done some interesting things in life, but I've met people who I sit there and go like, "Whoa, that's incredible." Um, but anyway, I, I I'll take whatever I can get. So, keep going. Sure. So uh, one of the reasons that I wanted to talk to Byrne, Byrne has a, a wonderful series um, called uh, Who We Are and How We Got Here on his Naturalist um, uh, channel that is something like, I don't know, a cultural commentary history or something like that running from... Yeah, kind of answering present. just one question of about the period of time from World War II to the present, and that is how we got here. And the, 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 the how we got here to what is very specific. It's so I'm not covering so much the political events. Uh, every now and then I'll touch them when they are germane to something. But I'm more interested in how people develop the mindset we have today, particularly the extreme uh, divisions and polarity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it sort of weaves uh, culture music, theology, and philosophy all together in that. But a big part of um, your story, and it's also a part of my story in a way, although obviously I'm too young, is the um, Jesus People movement of the late 60s and 70s. Um, well, you know, my channel is sort of a my own theological self-exploration that's kind of like, wait a minute, how did I get here and why? Mm -hmm. um, how did I get in this weird theological conundrum position that I'm in? Um, and uh, part part of that story is the, the Jesus movement. And I, I know stories from uh, my dad and from my dad's friends and, and some of the people I grew up going to church with that were of sort of the baby boomer or older generation. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, it's like one of those things where when you, you, when you grow up in the shadow that you almost don't even know the questions to ask. It's just sort of like uh, the, the background noise. And so when, when you've been talking about that part of your story and talking about it in your other videos, it's like, oh, that's helping me put together some, some pieces. That's kind mm -hmm. of my own who I am and how I got here story. So that's one of the things that... That I really wanted to talk to you about is sort of what was the Jesus movement? What was sort of the background of it? What was the what was it at its heyday? And what were sort of the after effects? And, and what does that what 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 all is going on in that? Because I think it's a underappreciated piece of American history, mm -hmm. um, really. That that still has a lot of legacy. You know, whether it's um, you know, the religious right of the 1980s and 90s and 2000s, which is something that I can remember, or, you know, mega churchdom in the suburbs. And, uh, you know, I, I play guitar in church on Sunday, which is something that wouldn't have been an instrument that you could play in church on Sunday without the Jesus movement. So, um, uh, you know, from, from things big and small, I feel like it's one of those underappreciated it's, it was almost like a, a an awakening like the great awakenings in the early american history right maybe not quite the same scale but closer than people realize well that era is sometimes i think it was theodore rojak uh in one of his books uh called it uh, uh, an awakening like the others i'm not so sure because it was on one level so big but on another level, so pluralistic that, um, in a way, the Jesus movement was the last thing to come out of the uh, out of the that period. Because it's like you know, there was obviously sex, drugs, and rock and roll. There was uh, the anti-war and the, the protesting. There was folk music. Uh, there was, um, of course, the Vietnam War itself. There was uh, these different leaders and then the assassinations and then a lot of cynical moves being made by the people in power. Um, America at the same time was probably never richer than it was in the 60s. And, um, and of course, there was uh, the hippie experience and LSD and drugs. And that really, uh, that bloomed. A lot of people became like innocent children and like children without parents uh the weight of that world started to collapse on them by 
1969, a friend of mine uh, who I keep in touch with, who was um, active in the San Francisco hippie scene. I was in the San Francisco Bay Area, but I was a slightly too young to really take part and go to the things in San Francisco, to which I have no limit of gratitude for. <laughs> because, because what happened was, it's like, I look at it as like, everything just got unhooked at that point. All the traditional things. I mean, there's a, a prehistory to the hippie scene and the beats, or what we sometimes call the beatniks, um, of people who were ch searching to live this authentic experience. There's a combination of things. On one level, you would get people who were completely materialistic and nihilistic, who were following more the French existentialist model. On the other hand, this is where you really started having people going east and following the uh, the model of, of, you know, the Eastern religions. Um, 1967, the summer, the quote-unquote summer of love, was like the heyday of it. But here's the thing about that. 1967, summer of love, actually never happened. And what I mean by that is there was no summer where everyone was in love where where uh, all these people were just like oh man it's just so groovy it's isn't it you know we're going to just change the world that happened the year before uh there was a big event called the human being in january of that year and uh that was a big deal uh it was a big deal in a small community it brought together uh the uh, many th uh, several thousand people from across the Bay Area in Berkeley and Oakland, but it also brought uh, people from other parts of the country. It also brought there's a whole story with Ken Kesey and the Merry Pranksters, uh, you know, groups like the Jefferson Airplane and the Grateful Dead and and others were just getting going. My favorite was Quicksilver Messenger Service and Moby Grape from that period. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but but. What happened was the news media saw that kind of as an outside observer, and they started to say, ooh, this is different. They also, of course, pumped up the more exotic elements of it, particularly, like I say, the sex, the new kinds of rock and roll, and uh, two drugs in particular, and one was grass, weed, you know, marijuana. The other was LSD, which had just been... Uh, made illegal for the first time. So people, have, you know, I'm not going to go into all of that. And nowadays, everyone has a conspiracy theory about how this happened. Everyone's saying it's it's all MK Ultra and all this stuff. I'm sitting there going like, you know, it wasn't. It was a bunch of people who were desperate to find some meaning in life. And, uh, you know, the things inside of their head gave them, they being materialists, saw these new things in their head. And some of them interpreted them as things happening in their head, and others interpreted them as ways in which we were connecting with the cosmic other. So the ones, so, yeah, go so ahead. Why was why was that generation sort of the older edge of the baby boomers, um, right? Kind of so I don't know spiritually open, and you might even say desperate, or you might even say unformed. <laughs> Well, consider who their parents were. Their parents had been involved in the the Great Depression, which most Americans, up until the recent pandemic, most Americans could not imagine an event within their lifetime where the actual uh, heart of the um, of of what may you know the gears of what makes America function was suddenly broken somehow prior to to the recent pandemic, everything we've seen, like you know September eleventh well yeah, that affected some airlines, you know uh, there was a lot more security, but the event itself was you know pinpointed in a couple of places, wasn't globalized in that sense I mean. People within a year where everything was back to normal. Um, the Great Depression was a deep, dark depression. It lasted at least 10 years. Of course, there were some people who managed to pull themselves out of it beforehand. But most people say it started in you know, 1929. didn't end until World War II 
which then kicks America into overdrive as a, as a power. So you got the parents going through the Great Depression uh, with that as a memory, and their second one is World War II. And they've got that as a, uh, a thing. And all, their, all the fathers, it was primarily fathers, who went off to fight in the war. Yeah, and they had these... That's my, that's my grandfather. My well, grandfather was, he grew up in the Chicago area, and he did ROTC in college. And then, you know, kind of in the build-up to the war, even before America was involved, right, they started calling people into active duty that mm -hmm. were in the military, you know, getting, you know, kind of ready that something was probably going to happen. Right. And he was out in San Francisco helping train troops and stuff like that. Right. And, and then, you know, had to go to Pacific Islands and stuff like that. I actually have an aunt who lived in San Francisco uh, in about two blocks from Haight Ashbury and was there from the early 60s to the early 70s. And her neighbor was like the sound engineer for the Grateful Dead. Mm -hmm. And so I have that well, aunt and then... Here's what happened. When those, when those uh, soldiers and sailors came home, they had children. And they basically told their children, you know, you're supposed to just live a normal life, follow the Ten Commandments, go to church, even though they themselves may not go to church or whatever. Uh, but And there was kind of a mini, some people call it a revival in the 1950s. I don't think the revival is quite the right, right. word. Well, Vander Clay will mention the fact that church attendance in the United States was at its all-time peak in the 1950s. Right, and a lot of... I think... I think that that might be somewhat attributable to automobiles and roads in that more people could just physically get to a church on Sunday. But there was also the kind of the uniformity uh, of the culture, the, you know, the we do what you're supposed to do, wear your suit, go to your job, go to church on Sunday. And this is a thing that sets us apart from the communists is that we go to church on Sunday. But I, it was mainly... It was mainly a mainline Protestant um, revival, right? Of a sort. right. Uh, well, Catholic churches were doing well too, and and but the thing is, you have to remember, the war did really affect everyone emotionally, and so a lot of the reason people were going to church, I think, was just to say, okay, we have to find what was valuable again, you know, and this was valuable to us. The problem is that. All those dads who came home, we didn't start talking about, you know, uh, the, you know, the problems of a, of a veteran coming home from war seriously as a culture until the Vietnam War. So all these guys came home, a lot of them just shut down. And then they would go hang out with their, their male friends, their soldier buddies, and they would drink, and they would, you know, get involved with all sorts of bizarre the stuff. The Lions Club or the, the other sort Wherever. of thing like that. Well, and what's also interesting is they left their wives at home, but they gave them all sorts of new conveniences in their new suburban homes with their new cars and new television sets. Uh, washing machines and dishwashers yeah. and microwaves. But in doing so, those new uh, suburbs and those new styles of living were all meaningless. They were, instead of... Um, Dorothy Sayers has a great essay called Are Women Human? And she talks about, uh, you know, women used to control the whole of the soap processing industry. They, would, they controlled the clothing industry. They controlled, you know, she was talking about the Middle Ages. They controlled all of these industries. This is what women did. And what happened was, essentially, the men got sent off to factories. And... The women were left at home, but all the things that gave them meaning and a sense of com completion, in fact, the first major item that was given to them back in the 19th century, which they were really happy to get rid of, but it was a devil's bargain, was soap making, because soap making is a real painful, difficult thing. But, but uh, so they said, okay, and there was a guy in England, Dr. Brown, who started making soap. So they gave that up. But slowly, by the time you got to the 1950s, women were just seen as kind of like ornamental uh, in this very strange sense. You know, they're supposed to have this kind of elaborate hair. You can see this in the early 60s, these beehive hairdos. But what do they actually do anymore? I, it, it's not surprising to me that there was a 
you know, the new feminist movement was a reaction to this, although I do believe it went too far. But um, so. But, but the the men, the greatest generation, the people who lived through the Great Depression and then fought in World War Two and come back, they didn't have a meaning crisis per se. They had had a very meaningful life, too meaningful perhaps. Well, that's the thing. And so and they didn't wonder what the meaning of life was anymore. They were like, I don't want any more of that hard stuff. Hey, think times are good. You know, exactly. Things, the America's rolling, so let's uh, let's be as comfortable and relaxed as we can because uh, let's put those hard times behind us. But then the kids who grow up in this super comfortable, super safe, super industrialized, commercialized world, they have this huge question of, okay, well, what's this all for? Because they didn't go through the hard times. They well, also, the those kids are asking questions like, and they're just finding out about things like Hiroshima or Auschwitz. You know, they, you know, when people can't, there was a bit of a mention of these things and discussion at the end of the war, but then it was quickly tabled. And it wasn't until the early 60s that this stuff started coming out on top the shelf and people started discussing it. And here's the problem. The parents had no answers because they had spent that intervening period relaxing from the war. Just like, and basically, it's just like, we deserve a break. You know, we went through the Depression. You know, they may have been the greatest generation, but they were certainly not that good at talking. You know, and that was a huge failure because, and this this was true of the churches, you know. Later, much later in life, uh, in the 90s and the, uh, the aughts, I started hearing uh, people I knew who were older guys who have since died telling stories of what the war was like. And I was just like, whoa, this is not your John Wayne story here. This is not, uh, this is not even Saving Private Ryan. You know, I mean, here's the story you've never seen a movie about because it is just way too dark. Old Italian guy in New York City where I used to get my mail. He had this little like, candy store, but he had mailboxes there. So I got my mail there. And one day he turns to me, his name was Lenny, and he goes like, he, he, he says like, you know, you know what gets me about the war? He goes like, you know, I was there on D-Day. We made it. That was great. And here's the thing I remember most. Well, you know, I, I, was, I took part in a gangbang with the, this French girl. You know, so it's like a bunch of... This is not an image we have in our minds from World War II. You know, a group of American soldiers raping a girl. But you know what? War just upends everything. And there's a lot of this kind of moral... The moral anchor of whatever it was holding America down on the ground really got yanked off there in World War II. And you can see the... You know, Playboy is a direct... The magazine is a direct result of the pinup magazines that that uh, they gave to soldiers to plaster the barracks with in World as War II. Booster, right? Exactly. But as a morale booster, it kind of ended up being, in the end, a mor moral changer. Mm -hmm. You see. And there was a lot of other stuff. I mean, I, I could go on and on. But to get to the Jesus movement, so you have this generation then who is asking all these questions. Part of them were political. For instance, when we talk about the free speech people, these people generally were not getting stoned in the same way that the hippies were. The hi and, and there was, in a sense, a real division between them. You could look at the, uh, the, the free speech movement people and the anti-Vietnam protests as being divided between these two real uh, opposing camps. And one was much more materialist, and the other was now this new cosmic juvenile. And what happened was the two kind of came together, but the, at that time, the radical elements, the, 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 like the Black Panthers and, and um, SDS and these other radical groups who were starting doing things that were actually very problematic with explosives, um, essentially these things kind of withered away. And what survived was not the San Francisco in the 19, 
66, this dream of, of renewing life through psychedelics. What survived instead was the 1970s. And the 1970s was all about, you know, the people still talked about liberation, but at that point, everyone was just kind of like, yeah, you just got to do whatever it is. So people still kept using drugs. Everything was upended. But the difference is, is the people in the about 66 were using drugs to try to find something. The people in 69, those ones who had come for the summer of love that didn't exist, they were just lost children. And hundreds of thousands of people just kept coming every year. I mean, uh, and this is how I understand... The, the, the gold had already been harvested in yeah. the same way, in the same way as in you know, the 49ers, all those people who came looking for gold, it was already gone by the time they got there. Right. Well, here's how I understand the origins of the Jesus movement. Now, if you read books on the subject... Uh, I haven't read a book on the subject. I felt really covered it very well yet. And one thing they tend to do is they say, well, there was a group up in Seattle and some people down in Los Angeles. And then there was this guy, Arthur Blessed, who was a Baptist preacher in uh, Los Angeles. And there's this guy, Lonnie Frisbee. And then this guy, Ted Wise, in the San Francisco Bay Area. And they start with looking like that. And I'm sitting there going like, no, 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 no. You have to look at it like this. Everyone knew where Ground Zero was. Ground Zero was the Haight-Ashbury. The, the group I was a part of was part of the Ground Zero group. They never got much publicity because unlike the people in Southern California, uh, they didn't make much of a big deal about it. Now you had places like Calvary Chapel down in Southern California, but they hadn't started to grow yet. You know, they were just nobody. Um, and so what happened was, uh, like Kent Philpot was the guy in our ministry, but there's also this guy named Ted Wise who had a houseboat in Sausalito and, uh, all these other people, uh, they start th th this handful of people who many of them were connected to the San Francisco, the Golden Gate Theological Seminary, which was a Southern Baptist seminary in San Francisco, in uh, Marin County. They, they, they saw that what was going on in the Summer of Love, and they especially saw that this wasn't just these blissed-out hippies. But, you know, they started realizing how many people were coming there and ODing, how many people were coming there and were desperate for answers, how many people were coming there and were... Ending up in something like prostitution or, or something like that. Yeah, well, it, was, it, it, it hadn't quite turned into prostitution, but it was just the free love... Open the doors for an awful lot of abuse. And also people were joining communes. Uh, drugs had changed in 67 from LSD. Heroin started coming in. Uh, abortions started becoming a real regular feature. So I know from Kent Philpot telling me personally that, you know, he said in, in 67 he went there and he, Ted Wise, and these other people were all the nucleus Lonnie Frisbee was there. Lonnie Frisbee ends up being a character who's like, uh, takes some of those ideas and goes down to Calvary Chapel. There's another person who goes up to the uh, Seattle area, and, uh, and there's a Linda Meisner up there who takes those ideas. Other people came to the San Francisco Bay Area. There was more than one Jesus people group in the San Francisco Bay Area. So it starts like that. They had uh, the first commune was opened up in the hate, and it was, I believe, it was called Soul Inn. And what they did was they uh, had, um, you know, they put people up and they had Bible studies. But one of the problems with having it there, I mean, the, the hate stayed active as this weird countercultural zone for quite a few more years. So even when I became a Christian at the age of 15 in 1970, uh, the, uh, the, you know, the Haight-Ashbury was still full on in many ways. 
And so what they had, what they realized is, okay, so this person decides to become a Christian. They come in, they live at this commune that's right in the middle of the Haight-Ashbury. And what do they do if they're feeling weak? They just walk back out onto the street and they'll just be absorbed by this. What at this, by this point, is no longer a bunch of people believing in peace and love. You know, I think by 1970, the Grateful Dead was out of there. You know, it was like people were saying basically like, this has gotten out of hand. We need to go. <laughs> you know, this is no longer this nice place. This is it turned into kind of a, a ghetto y sort of area, a kind of a hippie ghetto. And uh, people, uh, what happened in 1967 was also the predators started to come in. And depending on how you want to call different people, but uh, among them were people like uh, Anton LaVey of the uh, Church of Satan. Uh, Charles Manson came through there. That's where he got the bulk of his early followers. Uh, you, I think uh, it was the group in Berkeley, which was uh, Christian World Liberation Front, C CWLF. Um, they put out a paper called Write On. And um, it later changed its title to Radix. But they also had a side project that was connected with them called the uh, Spiritual Counterfeits Project. And at some point they had a list of, I don't know, 70 or 80 groups that had descended into that San Francisco Bay Area. It was, so to call it, I think, I think it's a mistake to call it a, a revival. It was more like a turkey shoot. <laughs> you know, in the sense that you had so many people coming to this one place. Now, it wasn't the only place, but you don't find, for instance, Greenwich Village in New York City being the same way. You don't find, you know, the swinging London being the same way. There was something unique about the San Francisco Bay Area. And so... It had a more theological tinge to it. Than, well, uh, theological, uh, is, uh, theological is the wrong the word. Movement, or... Theological, I think, is the wrong word. I think spiritual quest, mm -hmm. you know, um, many people were coming there, you know, so, I mean, in our group, we had people who had been in the Hare Krishnas who are now with us. In our group, we had people who had been, uh, you know, with various kinds of Eastern uh, systems who had come from us. Also in our group, we had people who had been doing $150 a day heroin habits. I mean, a very good friend of mine, young, uh, very uh, sensible girl. Uh, I eventually watched she got married, but but when she came in, she said she had a hundred and fifty dollar a day habit. Now, if you think about that in terms of our money today, that was a pretty darn big habit. But that's also because the heroin was much more expensive then. Right. That's that's also what I was thinking is. Is when you read about the opioid crisis now, I think a heroin habit's like five or ten dollars a day. Well, exactly. Uh, so, and that's part of the problem. But, but um, no. So, I mean, uh, another good friend of mine. I remember her telling me stories of being totally pickled out on acid, and you know, just being like a little girl with her friend, and they were they were like eighteen, nineteen years old, and they were just simply uh, playing in the mud on the side of the road. <laughs> you know, it's just like. Uh, it, it's like, you know, no, no sense of where they were at all. I mean, there was a guy named Ray. We used to call uh, you know, Ray. Everyone knew Ray used to be a speed freak. And he'd come in and he'd be like, hey, Ray, how's it going? He'd go like, oh, it's, it's going good. Because that's as fast as he could talk now. His, his nervous system had been so shot with meth, you know. So it was... You know, now it was different than the meth we're seeing now is different than what used to be injected back then. But still, it was this, I mean, now I became a Christian. I'd never done drugs. Nor was I a hippie. My hair was slightly longer. But that was about it. You know, but at the same time, I liked, you know, the rock music. And I felt betrayed by what I saw as the commercialism that came into the music. You know, yeah. to me, and so, so here, here's a question. So, why, why was it, why was there such a kind of a radical transformation of what Christianity looked like in the Jesus movement? We had already mentioned that during the 50s and into the early 60s, there was a, a peak in church attendance. 
but mainly it sort of buttoned up, uh, buttoned up the mainline Protestant and Catholic denominations where, you know, you would go in, you would dress nice, there would be an organ, it would play hymns, there would be a sermon that was probably not the most interesting thing in the world, and then, you know, everyone would be done and go their separate ways again. There was a very, you know, straight-laced, mainline, main street version of Christianity. What was different about Christianity in the Jesus movement, and why, Here, why was that the case? Here's the answer, the big answer to the question. So you're in the first Methodist church of, you know, I don't know, Santa Clara or someplace. And some guy comes in with patched jeans, torn, dirty jeans, long hair, wearing uh, some kind of strange shirt. What do you do? They'd probably kick him out. Or That's exactly him, what or, they did. Or give him dirty looks until he left. That's exactly what happened. Hippies were essentially not welcome in most churches, which I think was a massive failure on the part of so many churches. Because, you see, th those churches were made up of people who had spent the last 15 years or more basically wanting to return to normality, whatever that was. But what they really wanted was they wanted to live in their comfortable world with their conventional amusements. You know, this is the time when Las Vegas was booming for the first time. They wanted to live in a world where essentially we were, they didn't want to think about all the dark stuff anymore. So what happens? Their children, not all of them, I mean, when we talk about how many people became hippies and stuff, it's not the biggest percentage of that generation. However, Everyone was affected by it, even if it wasn't the uh, the largest percentage of people who were hardcore hippies. You know, because you start looking at uh, uh, the way people dressed in the 1970s. And I don't mean the hippies. I mean, look at the way Christians dressed in the 1970s. They're totally affected by the hippies. They've just got these modified haircuts that look much more, uh, you know, organized but it's slightly longer than they, what they were wearing. You know, it's like people are trying. But by that point, you know, it's like mm, the horse is gone and the barn door is burning down. The barn is burning down at this point. It's not just that you're going to get the horse back in there at some point. So there was this sort of cultural segregation between the hippies and the mainstream. And we, like I think you said, the, it's important to remember that the hippies were a smaller minority of their own generation than is often. Yeah remembered but the hippies weren't welcomed in say the first methodist church of santa clara or the first congregational church of you know wherever else and so there was this kind of um unmet spiritual need they were spiritually open spiritually hungry they had perhaps grown up in a pretty materialistic world but uh if psychedelics are good for perhaps anything they're good for perhaps shaking the the idea that that seems to make much sense well also but they didn't have any answer of where to go next see we're we're used to now seeing people walking around who have all sorts of weird looks you know, someone's got some huge thing in their ear that they're trying to look like they're from an African tribe or, a, you know, a, a Thai That's tribe. Like yeah. We're used to seeing people with long hair. We're used to seeing uh, women dress in a variety of styles. At that point, there was a sense of fashion and style among people that was very uniform. And in fact, there always had been. You know, you look back, there's a reason why everybody in the Victorian age looks like they're in the Victorian age. None of them look like they're in another age, you know. Whereas if you look at people in the 1990s, sometimes you go like, well, that guy's kind of dressing like he's from the 1950s, and that guy's dressing like he's a hippie, and that guy thinks he's a beat poet, and that guy thinks he's in a rockabilly band, and that guy thinks he's in a garage rock band from 65, and that guy's a 1978 punk, and this person's a goth, and that person's a death meddler. You know, it's just like by that time, all this chaos had broken out. But you see, no one had ever seen people with long hair. Guys with long hair. No one had ever seen girls, uh, you know, walking around having rejected fashion to wear granny dresses, but no brassieres, you know. 
not only that, when you looked at the imagery, when you listened to the music, if you were from an earlier generation, it made no sense to you whatsoever. It just seemed frightening. Especially, there's a, there is a line around 67. I remember as a kid where I was when I first heard Jimi Hendrix on a little transistor radio. You know, we didn't have, uh, you only got one ear for a transistor radio. There, there were no Walkman even yet. But I remember I was walking with a friend. We were walking in a little hill behind where we lived in this suburban area. And all of a sudden, the sound of purple haze comes out. And it's just like... <laughs> it's, it's the tritone. It's the one thing you don't do in music. The, this, this, this really tense chordal structure. <laughs> you know, it's just like... <laughs> and then it sounds like a tank is rolling through the room. And I'm so, we were just like, whoa! Well... A lot of other kids were getting the same notion. This music made no, you know, Jimi Hendrix, for instance, made no sense. 20 minute guitar solos you know, with these drippy, syrupy uh, guitar leads that were meant for people on acid to hear in multiple, you know, uh, echoey effects didn't make any sense to the parental generation. Um, you know, it was like, you know, the Eastern religion made no sense to anyone. So, uh, yeah, it was a time, you know, what's funny is there's this whole idea right now that people have gone back to this book called The Fourth Turning. And I think it's really funny because they're sitting there going like, yeah, and now we're probably, you know, it was just like there was the Revolutionary War and then there was the Civil War and then World War II. And now this, is, you know, at 70 to 80 year intervals. And now we're in the middle of this new crisis. I'm going like, hello. Did you forget about the one in the middle there? It's called the 1960s, which, as far as crises go, still makes this look really small. Because I, I, I often felt like 2020 was sort of 1968 on faint reverb. Right, right. right. You know, there was there was a, a race riots. There there was a there was even wasn't there a Hong Kong flu or something like that in 1968. Yeah, and, well, nobody uh, thought much and about then it. There was, you know, space stuff was kind of in the yeah. news again, but but it was all it was all just sort of like uh, a, a faint echo of how of the intensity that it right. in 1968. But what happened was the culture snapped, and it, it had been connected to the old Western paradigm the Western European paradigm. And at that point, it snapped. But I look at it like this. It snapped the way an ice shelf in the Antarctic snaps. So it's still near it. It's just like you can jump back and forth. But eventually, where we are now, there is no way to jump back to the past. And and I say this as someone who loves the past. But I have to admit, yeah, I'm not one of those people. I'm on the other side of it. You know, everyone is. You know, I was... I taught homeschool kids in Alaska who had never been exposed to, you know, so much of the stuff I had been exposed to, say, in New York City when I lived there. And I said to them, do you realize that you are far more ironic than anyone living in, say, 1965? And, and you guys are, what, 12 years old? Mm -hmm. Just your whole chain of references and stuff. They were listening to these Christian programs, which were totally postmodern. Uh, they were done for children. But the people making them were like, yeah, ooh, why don't we add this effect and do this? I'm sitting there going like, yeah, well, you got it. You know, welcome. But that's a different subject. When the Jesus movement uh, started, it started with these communes. So what happened was eventually our commune moved uh, further north into uh, San Rafael, California. And you said part of the impetus of this is it was just too tempting to still be in the belly of the Haight-Ashbury beast, uh, where there wasn't quite enough of a boundary between people trying to escape yes, some of the Yes, but there was... And then the temptation being all around. There was a sister ministry to ours, uh, and Oliver Heath was the guy who was running that one. He was also one of the original uh, people going on the streets in 67. And he uh, started an another house in San Francisco, but moved it away from the hate. Just because it was just way too, too much. But it was, um, 
Yeah, and there were little ministries all over. It wasn't like there was one unified thing. There were different people from different groups. And, right. and so well, there's a difference between the Jesus people and the Jesus movement, right? The Jesus movement is sort of an umbrella term for all the different things going on at that time. The Jesus people are a uh, something almost like we, a, we never distinguished. The nation isn't quite the right word. No, we never distinguished it at that time. And in fact, what we said uh, was basically by 1972, and the big event was called Explo 72. Uh, Bill Bright of Campus Crusade had a big event down in Dallas where he invited people like Johnny Cash and uh, Larry Norman and Andre Crouch and a number of other different kinds of singers and stuff. So people went down there for this thing. But it was amazing when you see the photos of it, and I, I've, heard, I've got a record album of it. The, the artwork on it is totally like, I don't know if the word Peter Max means anything to you, probably not, but this very pop, sort of commercialized pop art sort of aesthetic, very bright colors. It's like taking the really heavy, intense uh, use of color in San Francisco uh, um, posters, which I love, uh, and then just adding it to this kind of pop art aesthetic. It would take a long time to explain, but just these big washes of color, big bright orange with blue balls and stuff. And I'm sitting there going like, yeah, this is the end of it. Because, and and there would be like, people say, yeah, but what about Jesus People USA in Chicago? And I go like, yeah, they're, they're yeah, they went on, they call themselves Jesus People. But, you know, eventually it's something very different. Because what the Jesus people were, were Christian hippies. But hippies as a species kind of passed away around the same time. Yeah. And so, so what was Jesus people like in sort of that pre-72 era? What was its practices like? What was its theology like? Like what, what was going on? What did it look like? Well, first of all, we were never told. We had, for instance, in our group, Bible studies. They were usually on Wednesday nights. We also had a Saturday evening Bible study. There were two different communes, and we'd go back and forth between them. Uh, but we never had a Sunday meeting. And the reason for that was people were told, you can go wherever you want. Right, because it wasn't a church denomination. It was a ministry or a parachurch thing. It was yeah. an idea. Yeah. And so and also reviewed this kind of biblical teaching fellowship during the week, but, you know, going to church, that's your business. Right. That's at the very beginning. Uh, that changed, like I say, I became a Christian in 1970. By 1971 or so, that was pretty much on the way out. That that kind of laissez-faire, go wherever you want. Uh, we were already starting saying, we need, there was a guy, another guy, kind of infamous. His name was uh, Bob Heimers, Robert L. Heimers, who was also another student at the uh, Golden Gate Theological Seminary. And uh, <clears throat> he's even got a Wikipedia article for some of the shenanigans he's pulled. But anyway, at that point, he decided that he said, we have to start a Sunday service. And so we started a service under the name The Church of the Open Door. I think later they changed it to the Open Door Church or something because they had actually he had actually just stolen the name of a of a church down in uh, Southern California that he liked and uh, which is not good. But the point was we'd started these Sunday services, but we didn't have a building. We would just rent out a you know some sort of youth recreation hall or a some sort of right. a community. That, that, that sort of thing was very weird at that time, right? For a church to be meeting in yes. something like a public space right. that it was renting. But nowadays that happens all the time. But that was very, right. very right. new at that time. Well, it was brand new, pretty much. I'm, I'm sure that there were parachurch organizations that did things like that. But uh, as far as any actual church, no. But also... As you can tell from my description, a lot of the people who were the impetus for this church were coming out of the Baptist uh, school. Yeah, now, theological. yeah, so Calvary uh, Baptist down in, in, there was kind of a general Southern Baptist vibe. However, there was also a charismatic vibe. 
So it was both uh, the gifts of the spirits, prophecy. Eventually, our group got way too heavily into deliverance and such. Our group became very cult-like. Even though at the beginning, we were kind of like fighting cults, we, we became too... You were a shelter from the cults. Right? Yes. In the beginning. Yeah. So I remember going to the Children of God commune uh, in 1971 in the summer with some of the... I was only 16, 17, 16 at the time. And going with these people because some of our people had been taken and they had also taken over this uh, private school in uh, Sonoma County. And someone said... Can these are the ones that have infamous sexual practices, right? Yes. Eventually they would de devise what was called flirty fishing. Now what's weird about them is they were certainly Christians on some level. And at the same time... I don't know where they got these other ideas, but that's the, that's the times. And for instance, there is, there's always people who are, you know, like, um, I would say what, what was an actual Jesus people? I would say it was a Christian hippie and people who started to associate with them in groups like me, because I would never call myself directly a hippie, but, um, you know, and then there was a something about communes. There was something about uh, kind of being a witness to the counterculture. So we would show up at places like I remember going to this large peace rally in 1971 to hand out literature, uh, and it was very, uh, very much an eyeful for me. It was the first time I ever saw men in the march from San Francisco wearing see-through uh, gowns, women's gowns, and uh, marching. You know, it was like, uh, you know, oh, this gay thing's coming up, <laughs> you know. So, uh, but, it, you know, we, we were in a strange sense a part of all of these events that were happening. We would also hold, for instance, our, uh, uh, <clears throat> what is it, our baptisms in swimming pools down by the ocean and a river, wherever we could, you know. Uh, we didn't have any problem with any specific denominations. That is to say, if it was a standard denomination, there were, uh, there were denominations we didn't understand. That You know, it's just like, what's going on with the Seventh-day Adventists? We didn't know. And so you'd meet one, and you'd be like, so who are you? <laughs> you know, and, and then there were people like the Jehovah's Witnesses who were just further away. But, uh, but as far as your standard Christian churches, like, uh, now we never met any Orthodox. Although eventually the leader, Jack Sparks, the leader of the Christian World Liberation Front, I think by 1980, he had converted to Orthodoxy. Uh, and, but he was coming out of Berkeley, and Berkeley was a very different social environment. And I think he had, and, and I think the magazine uh, Radix and Write On show this, they had a different view on things than the rest of us. They, <clears throat> we used to say they were more left-wing. We were, we were not. Um, the leader of our group uh, prided himself on being a Republican, but he never, ever told us to be. There was no implication of which political party one should be a part of. And that's the, an interesting part of it, is that, so, I have occasionally seen people who have tried to rope in the uh, Jesus movement as part of the religious right, and I'm going like, well, you have no idea what you're talking about. You know, because there were some groups who are a little bit more right-wing, but then again, there were groups like Christian World Liberation Front uh, who are not. But nor were they communists or anything either. They were just simply a little more open to culture, open to... They were communicating with people at Berkeley. So, and we enjoyed hanging out with them. We'd learn new things, you know. It was just... And they, they would come up to our farm, communes, different people. It was a different sort of a thing. Also, our connection with the counterculture was interesting because we didn't hate it. We recognize the problems of the drugs in particular and the, un, the unchained sex. But as far as the music went, oh, the, our music was essentially an acoustic version of, you know, rock music from the late 60s. Right. And I think that's, that's probably one of the things that people have never heard of the Jesus movement should 
maybe be aware of. Even the idea, like I mentioned this earlier, of playing guitar, playing drums, and having rock-ish type music that was used in a worship setting or a Christian setting right. was completely new and extremely controversial. But and that's something that's completely taken over almost right. everywhere, you know. But I would say there's a huge, huge difference between what now pra- passes for your standard praise team and worship leader and what not than what was going on with us. We were kind of moving that direction, but we didn't quite get there. And uh, because we always felt that we never wanted things to become entertainment. And here's the thing. We often spent time raising questions about whether Christians could play rock music or not. And I think those were mistaken uh, questions. The question is, where is a good environment for that? The one thing we didn't ask, and this was to prove to be, the, I think, the Achilles heel of the entire Jesus movement, was we didn't ask, can, you know, we said, well, what about these heavy chords and stuff? Can Christians make, you know, rock music? We never asked this question, though. Can Christians make commercial music? And my answer to that question is no. And this is what I've seen. So what I saw was, see, in our group, I actually have some of the rare recordings from both our group and the ministries north of us in San Francisco. And, and basically, from uh, Sonoma County, Marin County, Sonoma County north up to Oregon, the groups were very different than they were in the Southern Bay Area, and particularly uh, Southern California. And so, in our groups, the northern groups, we tended to make music that was for ourselves. We never thought about selling it. We just simply made music. Now, there was some people would occasionally make a recording, but it was never, you know, a serious commercial recording. It was just like, why don't we try, try to capture this? Um, <clears throat> but I think... Um, what we did was we made very... I, I tend to look at it as one of the last genuine folk styles in America. Because it was, it was just our interpretation of certain kinds of music. It was a mixture of things like folk music, western, country and western, rock music, um, <clears throat> a bit of pop, sometimes a little bit of uh, gospel, into this very unique kind of acoustic rock sort of pattern. Um, but, so in our churches, it would often be just one or two people playing a guitar, maybe a violin, no drums, no bass guitars in church. Uh, we kept it on a low level. We didn't want people getting too excited. Uh, even though uh, many of our services were charismatic. So, right. uh, the music would be a big part of it, right? This is right. something I also associate with that time. Like, the music would go on for a really long time, almost like a hypnotically long period of time. Yeah, uh, our group, again, uh, and I think it's because we had Baptists who were near the top of the hierarchy. They were pretty suspicious of that kind of thing. We never wanted, we never considered ourselves full blown Pentecostal. And we always considered ourselves charismatic as being kind of a lighter variant on that thing. And I myself was wrote many songs and uh, played a lot of music. I never, I after a while, I distrusted how easy it was to uh, essentially manipulate the audience. Is how I would say it now. But to me, it was just too easy to know if I did this and then brought the tempo down, then slowly worked it up, people would get into a certain kind of a mood. And I just felt like, eh, it's too easy. There's something wrong with that package. Well, here's the problem, though. We were doing our own thing. When slowly recordings from Southern California started drifting up. So one of the first ones was the first Maranatha album. 
uh, and then the second one, and then groups like Love Song, eventually the second chapter of Axe, and Barry Maguire and stuff. And there's some very interesting early albums up till about 75, 76. But what started happening was, uh, for instance, Maranatha started getting very slick about their productions. And they also started making these instrumental albums. So you could kind of just like, to which we kind of looked at that as like, well, wait a minute. Why do we want to make albums like easy listening music? That's really weird. And eventually, though, we started getting songbooks that had those songs in it. Whereas prior to that, we have these really funkily made songbooks of our own, where we would get songs from all sorts of places, including writing, writing our own. And so I thought it was fascinating that uh, eventually the Southern California style took over everything. And it was a very commercial style. Eventually you have the creation of what would later be called CCM, Contemporary yeah, Christian that's, Music. That's sorts of contemporary right. Music. But I would say that it is in no way similar in most respects to the early Jesus people music, which had a much more, it was much more connected to the folk uh revival of the early 60s just as the hippies themselves were more co connected to the folk protest movement whereas the later people getting stoned had no connection at all so it it's there's this big switch that happens at this point and and this is why i said that the the exploit 72 is kind of the end for me because at that point the the commercial forces within christianity have figured out how to adapt and take it to where they want to go with it, you yeah, know. Well, I feel like part of that, and another another legacy that I sort of attribute to this time, is that a lot of the the you know the Jesus movement and other related groups would kind of eventually tell you to sort of stop listening to rock and roll, or maybe not to listen to as much of it. And so then, but then you give a alternative, right? There's the Here's the Christian alternative, right? It, it might not have the heavy Jimi Hendrix chords and blazing guitar solos, but it kind of sounds like maybe Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young. Or exactly. And, and it has Jesus lyrics and stuff like that. And so you can have countercultural music, but it's not Jimi Hendrix. It's, you know, Jesus music. And so there's this sort of fast following of right. counterculture where it's sort of imitating it, removing perhaps some of the darker elements, Christianizing it, but it's always sort of a couple of years behind. Right. And that's something that will be even a characteristic of evangelical Christianity right. in my youth. Right? Is, that there is the Christianized version right. of the popular mainstream that you're supposed to listen to instead. If you're hearing a lot of rumbling on my side, I am. It's because it's raining cats and dogs here. Suddenly, uh, there was like a big dump. So, anyway. Uh, yeah, no, I... Uh, no, what's interesting is I, I had a record collection prior to becoming a Christian as a kid. <clears throat> it was a pretty good-sized one, too. I had over 500 little singles and 100 albums, which is not bad for, like, a 15-year-old. Um, and... Um, but... No one ever told me I needed to sell those or get rid of them or do anything to them. I, in, I wish now I had simply put them away. <laughs> but I sold them all. Oh, oh, wonderful me. I sold them all for about $15 or something to get uh, a, a Christmas present for my mother. I have no idea, which I don't even remember what it was. Uh, because I just felt like, oh, I don't really need these anymore. I later would kick myself when I started studying music more seriously every time I had to buy one of those again. It was just like, oh, you shouldn't have done that. Um, but uh, it's even worse with comic books. If I had kept the comic books I had as a kid, I could have like bought houses <laughs> with <laughs> how much they became worth around the year 2000. So... Um, but no, it was, it was always just... Our group was never one of these ones who said... You know, we were not heavily into the spirit of censorship. You know, what we were was we were much more into, uh, you know, if someone had the stuff, you can put it away or, you know, listen to it, whatever, at home. <clears throat> Couldn't listen to it so much on the communes. 
But then we did start listening to more of this stuff on the communes, particularly as the communes went on into 74, 75, 76. And later, I left all of my Christian records behind, too. So it was like, and later I kicked myself all over again because I had to go out and find them. And, uh, and, and I thought to myself, this is getting ridiculous. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like, you don't just cut off your past. You have to, yeah. if you want to understand. My, my dad's record collection picks up in about 1977 or 1978, I think for very similar reasons as, as, as what you just said. But like, but before the 60s, you know, even into the 50s, religious music was divided from secular music. That divide between religious music and secular music is very old. But gospel music didn't need to look to rock and roll to figure out what gospel music should be. Gospel music had a very strong sense of itself, and if anything, rock and roll was stealing from gospel oh, yeah. music. Oh, yeah. Uh, treasure Trove, not the other way around. Right. And even, like, I love blues music and bluegrass music from, like, the 20s and 30s, and a lot of the blues musicians would have an alter ego that played gospel music. Sure. And a different ego. The, they would be Reverend Deacon Brother so-and-so when they played their gospel right. music, and then they'd be Blind Willie Mississippi this or that, you know, when they were playing their blues music, and there was, you know, a similarity and a difference. But a lot of the times the religious music was a, of a higher caliber than the blues music. And and so there there was kind of that divide between religious music and secular music well, before. But the weird thing that happens in the 60s, I feel like, is that it, the religious music stops being its own thing but becomes this like sort of quick following copycat secular uh, Christianization of the popular thing, which is... Well, before, sort of what it had been. before it started doing that, Christ, if you if you go find any Christian album before the say the year 1965, it's going to be a, a, anything made in the middle of the 20th century. It is going to be almost impossible to listen to because the music is so badly done, and it's it's got strings. It's the the voices are like overly emotional in bad ways. And what had happened was that Christianity had absorbed the a co commercial version of the sentimentality of the romantic movement of the end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century, it, had, it started to absorb that around 1875. <clears throat> By 1965, it was everywhere. It was in the Catholic Church, it was, you know, it was just, it was, and it was just like mind-numbingly bad. You would just, like I say, and nobody, no kid, no uh, respecting adult, nobody who liked music would listen to this. So, what happened, though, was... This madness was almost part of the point. <laughs> well, what happened, though, was then, as the music started to become commercialized from the Jesus rock music at the beginning, that essentially what happened was the same thing came in. Because the people actually making, the companies actually making the records were saying, okay, we've got to, uh, we've got to sell these to people. This is how you get praise strings from Maranatha. Essentially, they took the same <clears throat> idea and then just put it in slightly new clothing and sent it out. And so much of Christian music since then, I mean, I have a book this thick, of uh, an encyclopedia of Christian CCM. It was put out near, uh, uh, somewhere around 2004, 2005. Anyway, you could immediately cut half that book and throw it out because the music is so bad. Because it was more, now it's going to be, you know, like the, some girl singer singing about how much Jesus loves her in a very special way. You know, it's like, um, Christian, me and G Jesus is my boyfriend music, you know. It's going to be people singing imitations of all this stuff. I mean, even someone who is pretty well respected, like Keith Green, I would just go like, I listen to it again, I go like, well, he's Elton John. You know, you listen to these people and you go like, you'd hear the influences. And my point was has been 
you know, for a long time. And this is, I think, partly because we were doing this ourselves. <clears throat> you don't need to imitate anybody. And Christians have had a great tradition of music. So why do you need to imitate anybody? Right. You know? And to me it's sad when I first started hearing about Christian metal bands and Christian rap bands and Christian punk bands and Christian ska bands. I'm just sitting there going like, uh, yeah, let's just call them all Christian propaganda bands. And yeah, yeah, some of them have some good music now and then. But, you know, the truth is, this is all just music to keep you in the Christian bubble. So you don't understand what's going on in the world around you because your parents... Well, to give you enough of the culture to not feel like you're missing out, but to also still be a border marking distinguisher that keeps you from being fully in the main Right, right. Well, I was much more influenced by the in the 1980s. I went to Labrie in 1978, and that's really what completely changed my mentality going there. Uh, and I started, among other things, is uh, I don't know if you've noticed on my channel, I've been kind of annotating visually the lectures of Dr. Hans Ruckmacher about Christian art. And my... I had gotten influenced by him. Once I understood what he was saying, it was like, you could come up to me with an atomic bomb and blow it up in front of me and say, this is what we're going to do for Jesus. You know, you must come with us. And I go like, no, nope, sorry. I'm not doing it. Because <laughs> I already saw this is this is wrong. You know, the, to to be propagandist for Jesus is wrong. You know, and uh, I mean, there's a lot more to this subject, but but basically, I think that see the the Jesus people died because it was naive, and one of the problems we had in our group was <clears throat> we had events start to happen that caused us to spin out of control. So one of them was uh, there was a house called the Baraka House, which had started in San Anselmo, California, near San, San Rafael. And then it was moved up to Petaluma, California, into a larger farm. And I remember in the summer of 1971, there were 35 people at one point in a two-bedroom house in all these little shacks that were on this farm. And this is because we were still getting the fallout from the, the hippie migration to San Francisco. But eventually that tapered off. But in, uh, in, the, in the moment in January of 1973, I graduated high school early. And I went to live up there. And when I went up there to live, I hadn't actually followed what had been happening with them. I just knew I wanted to live there after I got out of school for a while. So I went up there and there was chicken wire on all the windows. And then I was told, and only with me, there were four people there. And I said, what happened to everybody else? And they said, well, there was, you remember this guy named Red? Well, he had turned out he had, you know, he was a San Quentin convict. And uh, he essentially started doing all sorts of shady stuff and involving other people here who were the weaker Christians and such. And so we kicked him out. And all those other people went with him. And so he actually unplugged our big freezer that had all the pork in it and it all was ruined a huge, huge freezer f full of all of our own uh, uh, slaughtered pig meat um, he also slashed all the tires on all the cars and there were a bunch of them and he threatened to firebomb the place so now that's a huge problem so what do you do with that you know, and this I think gets to something very much at core to a lot of issues. It's like this is why naivete can never win, because you can't think like a San Quentin convict, you know, no matter who you are. And if you're going to be naive, you're just food. That's all you are. You're food for people like that. And so we had to start making ourselves wiser. So, and which meant we had to start creating rules for ourselves. And eventually, o over the next year or two, we connected up with this much larger entity, which had no specific name, but was later known as the Shepherding Movement. 
And the shepherding movement was essentially a pyramid structure in which there were five guys on top. And they were supposed to all report in on each other and help each other in their walk. But then below them, there were other leaders and elders, and they were supposed to report up to them, and they were supposed to get reports from the people below. And it went on and on and on. And they had managed to get in so many different uh, independent churches, charismatic churches, Jesus people churches, uh, you know, and this was in the mid-70s. Um, and then after a while, it's kind of like, who you married, you know, where where you lived, uh, everything was was part of you were reporting you know how much money you made what you did with it was all being uh, you know you had to get permission for everything and it wasn't so much about families as much as it was about uh, well they used the word discipline we need Christians need to be disciples the only way to be a disciple is to be under somebody. And to report back in. And this is where we started getting really cultish. So, for instance, this, um, uh, not uncoincidentally, uh, after the Exorcist film came out, uh, we had already been dabbling in uh, what we called deliverance sessions and casting demons out of people. But after that, it just started taking off everywhere. You know, and people would say, like, you know, people have drugs, they listen to rock music too much, they are involved in the occult and Eastern religion and all this stuff. And so, um, you know, people would, would have these long exorcism sessions that would, you know, go on and they would you know, involve screaming and puking and doing all this stuff. And I had managed to stay above it for a long time, figuring, like, I don't need this. But then eventually they got me, they pressured me into it. And then, like, within a month or two after that, there was another sister church that was connected with this whole thing uh, further down in another town from us. And they made front page news for all the same kind of stuff we were doing. And so we stopped. Almost like a struggle session or something like that? Well, no. I mean, it's hard to characterize a deliverance session like that. This isn't trying to get you to... uh, change your ideas. This is you essentially uh, looking for the demons inside of you, naming them, and then as people were praying over you, doing whatever you could to manifest some sort of sense of relief from it. Um, That's as much as I'm going to say right now. It's much more complicated than that. And here's the thing, is I think somewhere in all of this, there were some genuine issues. But it became a hysteria, you know, and it just spread and spread and spread. So, and that, you know, it's these kind of things. And, and, and they stopped and they stopped like a month after me. And I was like, (laughs) ah, if only I could have held out a little longer, (laughs) but, but you can see now the problems. The other problem we were having is we were just becoming another conventional, comfortable church with you know a few little additions and once you got rid of that exorcism thing we just looked like another independent you know church uh, and some variant in that church is still there today but they've gotten rid of the the excesses of the authority structure but i think you know we've got a yeah i i often tend to look at my jesus people experience divided in half and the first part is really fascinating and then that part after when after the, the problems arrived and when people tried to find discipline, that's the real troubling part. And the fascinating part is that, for instance, when I was in high school, I mean, where else has this happened? I'm in high school. I have my high school friends. We will hang out together and we'll be talking about, I don't know, reading David Brainerd's journals or John Wesley's journals or... You know, someone found this new book by Martin Luther, or, or did you read about, you know, we'd talk about all these, these people from the past. We would be looking for, actively, for uh, books in Christian history. We were actually given a pretty decent introduction to Christian history uh, through the same crazy guy who started the churches. But he did know his stuff, and uh, most of what he said held up today. And what doesn't hold up, I was going, okay, I see what he was saying, but I disagree. But um, that's somewhat unique. Uh, I feel like a lot of 
these sort of revival movements and, and the, the groups more that were associated with what my dad was uh, in had very little sense of Christian history. Right. You know, it was basically oh. early church, a couple shout outs to Martin Luther, then right now. Right. And Whereas, whereas, and we, we were among those people who, you know, idolized the early church, you know, but, uh, you know, Hey, we'd read St. Francis's little flowers. We'd read, uh, uh, you know, Augustine was, was, uh, showing up on the menu. I started reading C.S. Lewis. I read G.K. Chesterton. I then discovered, uh, George MacDonald prior to watching Star Wars when it first came out. So I walked out of Star Wars going like, yeah, there's no imagination there. Not after reading The Golden Key by George MacDonald. You know, it's just like where the, you know, it's just like, okay, that's, that's serious fantasy. George Mac, uh, you know, George Lucas, uh, Star Wars. This is just commercial fluff. And I can see why people are excited. It's been a, it's been a rough decade and this is making people happy, but I was already kind of beyond it. And then I started getting into stuff that nobody was reading. The, except a lot of it was Christian, so they couldn't really say anything to me. So I was reading Solzhenitsyn. I was reading the back half of C.S. Lewis's catalog. Uh, Paul Paul Vanderclay will often say, yeah, Byrne says uh, The Discarded Image is one of his best books. And so Paul started reading it. Oh, I never read this. Paul, a, a, a pastor, never read that. But that's because it's just like I, I suddenly developed this mentality of like, well... If this guy is good, let's keep going. Why should I stop at the stuff that's obvious? Let's let's go look at his other books that are more difficult. Um, and uh, ev eventually there started to be for me a, a, an end to my time there. And I'm not going to go into all of that because it's like uh, too long for this. But what eventually happened was my reading and my constant quest to understand more led me eventually to go to Libri in Switzerland. And that was the moment where it was like there as Christians, they said, Oh no, Christians really have to use their minds. I was just like, thank you. That's all I wanted to know. That wasn't all I wanted to know, but you know, that was a big thing. The other thing I learned at Libri is, so, is that why, why do you think before going to Libri that there was this sort of sense that Christians shouldn't, use their minds because this sort of anti-intellectualism or uh, something you know whatever you might want to call it does seem like an ingredient in the kind of the larger Jesus movement thing well and a, a certain a, some sort of legacy from it it's it's an ingredient in uh, many wings of Protestantism it's an ingredient in a lot of the wings of the charismatic churches, it's an ingredient, of course, in Pentecostal churches as well. It's an ingredient on many of the churches that come after the Baptist churches. It's an, an ingredient in many of the holiness churches. It's an ingredient that comes out of, well, let's see. So there's Martin Luther, John Calvin. There was also Zwingli, but uh, there's the Anabaptists. And then there's the Pietists. And the Pietists are kind of like, they are the people who started saying things like, Jesus really loves me, and Jesus loves you. And they started being very emotional about it. And they didn't start off to be anti-intellectual, but they put a whole lot, I mean, if you look at John Calvin, he's spending an awful lot of time reading. I mean, one of the reasons Paul Vanderclay is who he is is because he's a Reformed Christian right. in the in the Calvinist. Right. They, they have their whole... Yeah, self-standing philosophical theological tradition, you know, through all those people that Paul Vander Clay will often mention, they never lost their intellectualism. Well, oh, they've gone through waves, but essentially they respected the mind much more. Hmm. Whereas, and and Labrie in Switzerland, Dr. Francis Schaeffer was also uh, in that tradition. So, and, and they would often use the phrase that... Uh, you know, you have to love the Lord your God with all your heart so, and mind, you know, all of you, essentially, not just the religious part of you. So, uh, like I say, I always had enough respect for all the different branches of Christianity that, you know, I could read G.K. Chesterton and go like, oh, okay. And occasionally he'd make some dig at Protestants and I go like, yeah, we probably deserve that. 
<laughs> you know, it's the same with, you know, like, right now, the whole stuff with Jonathan Peugeot. And, and, you know, I'm living in an Orthodox country, and it's like occasionally they'll they'll make some comment like, uh, I don't know if you're a Christian. <laughs> you know, I'd be like, yeah, I'll take it. You know, whatever. So, so that, that, that honestly is another question that I wanted to ask you about is, so, like, in, wh in whatever in the world is happening in our corner of the Internet, we seem to, even the Protestants among us, seem to be accidental shepherds towards orthodoxy. Um, I, I think I have even served as an accidental shepherd towards people in an orthodox direction and have talked with orthodox people on my channel. Um, you know, what, what's going on with that? And then, but also what, what role, I don't know, what does it mean to be a Protestant still? After well, that is the question. You're, you're I mean, in Georgia, it would seemingly be as easy as falling down the stairs for you to become an orthodox convert. Oh, exactly. And, uh, yeah. Uh, but no, I, I've, for me, I mean, part of it is I think that the best parts of Protestantism connect to the prophetic tradition of the Old Testament. They look at the, the they are the ones who are saying, you know, you know, it's just like, no, sorry, just going to the temple doesn't do it for you. It's all about, you know, your relationship with God. And so if you, if you do all the things in the law and yet the, the attitude of your heart is not right, you have violated the spirit of God. Now that would be like an Old Testament version. Paul is kind of connected to that in many ways. I mean, you look at his words in Romans and such, and he's basically saying, okay, we're, we're, there's a lot of problems in the world, and we've all got it. You know, we, we none of us can claim to be above the fray. So you just can't say, I go to the right church and, and, and such. And they were already having these church division problems by that point because of the difference between the Jewish Christians and these new Gentile Christians. Uh, I tend to think that, that um, I, I kind of welcome the Orthodox stuff. And at the same time, uh, people have often said, Burn, how come you aren't Orthodox yet? And to which I'm going like, well, it's because you used the word yet. You know, if you didn't, if you didn't imply that was the only possible way to go, you might have my ear a little more. You know, it, and that is one of my larger problems is that that uh, it's essentially it's a little too restrictive on who they consider to be Christians and who the, is not. And I think the reason that they're making headway is because so many of the other denominations have caved in in very serious ways so that they end up just being, I don't know, liberal uh, Christian, yeah. Christian social clubs, you know, therapeutic centers where we make uh, people uh, who are older and, pe and young children feel good about themselves. And we have nothing to say to anyone who's 25 years old. Right. Well, I, I feel like part of part of what's going on is I feel like the Jesus movement and kind of its flavors and tones and sort of stuff, by the time that baby boomers are getting married and having kids, that sort of hippie, freer, looser stage of the Jesus movement just needs to come to an end. And it kind of... Mer like you know the like the two ingredients I feel like by the you know I'm I'm a millennial and older millennial so I grew up in a church that was sort of this weird legacy holdout from the Jesus movement you know and you know, like kind of a, 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 a heterodox version of that right you know, it was it was the way story. right and so I grew yeah. up in this thing that had kind of reformed itself into a church from a thing that had just previously been kind of a movement. But I also go to the evangelical churches around me for youth group and summer camp and mm -hmm. vacation Bible school and all those kind of normal things. And I'm like going to like Willow Creek, the, you know, the really big Chicago mega church. And I feel like some, somehow what happened in American evangelicalism is that the Billy Graham stream and the Jesus movement stream Met and sort of well, that is precisely Bill Bright and Campus Crusade. That is precisely what happens because who else is speaking there? Billy Graham, right? You know, and uh, yeah, no, that's precisely the moment. That's why I consider that the end of the official Jesus movement. Just as 
the hippie movement seems to have died around that time too, or even earlier. So I think, see now, like I say, for me, when I go back in my mind, there are two different periods. Now I'll meet, I have, you know, Facebook friends who are from the, uh, second period. And they will say, oh, this is the Jesus movement. And I'll go like, yeah, it's the, it's the, it's the long downhill slide. So you have aspects of it, but you don't have the thing I had at the beginning. And the thing I had at the beginning was much more wild and woolly. You know, that is to say the people that I was meeting had these incredible, incredible experiences. They had, uh, you know, it's just like when people talk about the San Francisco Bay Area. Well, I wasn't, I was just too young to be a hippie. I, I almost, in 1969, when I was 14, I wanted to go to what would turn out to be the Altamont Rock Festival because it was going to be much closer to my home. And then they changed it at the last minute for a lot of reasons. And I'm so glad they did. Again, it's one of those things that's just like, oh, man, am I glad I didn't go to that. Because it was such a, you know, in the language of the time, it was just such a king bummer. You know, it was just like this royal bummer of just chaos and death. And I think I would have gone there and maybe just gotten super confused. Because that is what was happening by 69. It would have been a very dangerous place for a 14 year old. Well, exactly, exactly. And I had in my mind that somehow I could just show up at this place. You know, I wasn't, you know, I was thinking of hitchhiking there or whatever. You know, my, the, the mind reels at the stupidity and naivete uh, that, that goes on inside of, of ourselves at certain ages. Um, but I'm, I'm so glad I didn't. But nevertheless, so I, I was just shy of being part of that world. And, but yet I had a, a balcony seat from, you know, San Rafael, California, where I was living when I was younger. I had a balcony seat to watching what was going on. People would come from Berkeley, uh, where there was some riot, come over to our classes in San Rafael and tell us what they witnessed. Um, but also when I became a Christian, then I started meeting people who had come there in 67 or come there in 68 or 69. And they would tell me the stories of what it was like living in San Francisco. And, and you just go like, well, glad I never did that, <laughs> you know? And, and it just seemed like, you know, sorry, this was not liberation. This was enslavement. Yeah. So my, my dad, when he talks about his experience, it also seems like there's sort of this two phase thing. Where the early phase, like my my dad was, I think, I think he was, he got born again in college. So I think sort of one of the end of his hippie phase of life was there was the Sly and the Family Stone concert in Grant Park in Chicago mm -hmm. that never ended up happening because it just turned into a protest about nothing. Right. In 1968, there was the Chicago protests at the Democratic National Convention that, you know, the whole world is watching protests, right, in downtown Chicago, because that's where the Democratic Convention was. And that had a purpose. And then by like, I don't know, this is 1971 or 1972, Sly and the Family Stone's going to be playing in Grant Park in Chicago. And all and that's attracting the hippies from, you know, the whole Midwest. And it just never gets going because there's just riots and Right. Anger and those right. you know, smashing cop cars, but it's not even, like in 1968 they were trying to. They were mad because of which Democratic candidate you know gets nominated and that affecting the trajectory of the war. In 1971, they're just angry about yeah, you know who knows. And, and well, the war was like, still going on. The war was still going on, and so people were at this point they had focused all their hatred on Nixon and. The other vilified target that I remember was the silent majority. And these two, you know, and plus all the government people and whatnot. But uh, at, by this point, though, the whole, the thing had already been broken. So that, that but even the counterculture now is dying or, or almost dead. And so what's left is just... You know, so people are, you know, even the politics and stuff, it's all changing. And it's turning into these hardened forms. I mean, what we're seeing today is the result of one of the hardened forms from the 60s. 
It wasn't the Martin Luther King strain, but it was more connected to the people who were much further left than Martin Luther King. But it was also the other liberation movements. So you had the women's liberation, gay liberation. But the Jesus people was like the last of the bunch, really. And uh, many people looked and at it. was it, picking up the pieces of a lot of these things, right? Yeah, a lot of people so looked at later, it. There was some people needed to bottom out sometimes before they were ready for, for the Jesus movement. Yeah. And, uh, but, but like I said, there was a moment it started to get commercialized down in Southern California, seriously. And that was going to turn. So, so certain things, and we should probably start wrapping this up now. Certain things, um, transferred to the larger body. So there was a relaxation in clothing. So if you go to churches now. If someone comes in there looking strange, you know, it's not going to create too much of right. a, and, a and, buzz. And this is sort of where I was going with sort of the melding of Billy Graham and the Jesus movement, creating sort of the evangelicalism of the 90s and 2000s that a lot of millennials like me grew up in. Right. Is that it was seeker sensitive, right? You know, they got rid of all the things in churches that, you know, even sometimes to the point of getting rid of crosses that might turn somebody off, right? The whole goal was to get people inside and to be as unoffensive and attractive as possible to a bright swath, uh, as broad a swath as possible. Right. This was really big in, you know, the giant suburbs that are being made in, you know, all of these big cities, right? Like, you know, there's the mega church in like Orange County, California, and the mega church in, you know, Willow Creek being the Chicago version is, you know, out in these suburbs that, you know, 10, 20 years ago didn't exist. They were right. farms that got turned into ticky tacky houses. Right. And then a giant 10,000 person church in the middle of this whole thing. Um, and, and that it had. Rock is that like. like head drums and is that, that close to like that Aurora? Rock. What? Say that again. Is that close to like Aurora in that area? Um, yeah, pretty kind of, kind of close. Yeah. yeah. Like West kind of, you know, what what in the 50s was not part of Chicago, but then by the 90s was part of the, the, right. the metro area. And and that it, it took all of these ingredients and sort of just had this very kind of watered down, I don't know, Jesus loves you, relatively thin theology. It was always about sort of conversion experiences, but it never kind of took you past the conversion experience right, sort of right. thing. But it did a lot of good for a lot of people, and a lot of it was mainly um, baby boomer parents for their millennial children. Because once you have children, you know, you want them to go to church, you want structure, you want moral education, and all these things. And I feel like left and right, maybe you're not as exposed to this because you're, you know, out of the country, but these mega churches are just collapsing and imploding left and right, and it, it's kind of staggering. Sometimes it's because of the moral failings of the leaders, or sometimes it's just right. because, I don't know, the, the, the reason for their existence just seems to be swept out from under them. And I feel like a lot of this sort of attraction to orthodoxy that we are talking about is millennials who are seeing the implosion of the churches that they grew up in and looking for something stable, and so what's stable? Well, the Orthodox Church has been the Orthodox Church for coming on 2,000 years, so I don't think... Right. Gonna implode that is the point. That is the point. And also, uh, you won't find the Orthodox Church having, like, uh, big conflicts with science about yeah. evolution. Yeah. I mean, they just the simply evolution. believe what they believe about creation, and they don't worry about that. Uh, part of it is because uh, they take a lot of it symbolically, you know. Uh, but also, uh, they don't, you know, things don't change. And the value of that is that, therefore, they are solid, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I remain connected to this prophetic branch. So there's a part of me that always has to say, like, now, why are you doing that? You know, <laughs> where did that idea come from? Where did that start? I'm always wanting to know where things starts and who who started doing it first. So, you know. But, uh, well, let's... Uh, got any final questions here? Um, I guess... Uh, I don't know. Where, where do you see... How does this corner of the internet fit in and, and what do you hope that it accomplishes, if anything, and, and what do you wish for it? 
I think there has been some, you know, I, I am trying very hard to make how we got here number 12. And it is complex to try to describe the last decade. And I will certainly make some mistakes because it's too close. You know, it's like I won't. And some, someone will say, hey, but you didn't mention uh, Mr. Medicare or you didn't mention, uh, you know, what happened here in Gamergate? <laughs> you know, it's like I'll, I'll miss things, you know. But I think that uh, wh what happened, I th and I think this is why Jordan Peterson is important. Because Jordan Peterson came along and, and the atheists were feeling pretty smug. Except for one big problem. The whole atheism plus thing. Where it was like, you got to be an atheist, but you've got to be, well, what we would now say is woke. You know, so, uh, and that started to undermine things. And Peterson then comes along and basically says, hey, wait a minute, there's more. <laughs> You know, and I think people who hadn't thought about meaning or responsibility or the existence of God or, you know, what their motivations were, the nature of evil, these kinds of questions were suddenly going like, oh, yeah, what he was doing was reminding us of some of the most basic questions of life. Whether he was answering the question well or not is another point, but he was raising the questions. Um, that's why someone like Paul Vanderclay jumped on in. That's why someone like Jonathan Peugeot suddenly gained a lot of traction is because they become part of this discussion. But also you find people like, I don't know, Benjamin Boyce or Eric Weinstein or, you know, uh, Tim Pool or there's all these peripheral characters, Sargon of Akkad and, and uh, even crazy guys like Milo, you know, they're it's all part of this thing, and the interesting thing about it is there's room for discussion. I mean, you often see, like, if you watch someone like Tim Pool, who'll go out of his way to say, well, I'm not really a right-winger, but at the same time, I got no love for the Democrats, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm much more independent, and he'll say, on this kind of thing, I'm more uh, left-wing, on that kind of thing, I'm more right-wing. Um... And then he'll be talking to someone who's a Christian, you know, but then you'll see someone like Paul talking to someone who's got different ideas than him, like John Verveke. John Verveke's not a Christian. And I think in that circle, and it's a, it's a pretty broad circle, actually, it goes all over the place, you know, so whether it's, it's, you know, I mean, we're having the kinds of questions, we're having the kinds of dialogue. This should have been happening culturally in the broader culture in the 1990s. But instead, it's happening in this other sphere. Um, in a way, I think there's more honesty. You know, so someone like Douglas Murray is gay, but he doesn't come out acting like he's the latest evolved creature. He's a human being. And he goes, this is who I am. But he doesn't present himself as being like unquestionable or that his homosexuality is unquestionable. And it's that kind of thing that, that you know, there are more Christians who are willing to have dialogue. Having said that, I am pretty sure there's also quite a few who have no idea what's going on right now. Okay. You know, uh, many of them, you know, if someone said BLM, they all just said, amen, BLM. You know, if someone said COVID, they go, okay, put on a mask. They didn't ask any questions. But I think there is this group of people asking questions. Now, there's all the questions about what it all means. And, and you know, uh, there's an antagonism with this newer breed of what I'm calling the hydra of these different heads on the yeah. side that are, you know, you, you, it's like one minute, it's like, anti-racism the next minute it's trans you know then it's fourth wave feminism then it's you know PETA or something you know it's just uh, all these different things that come at you and circle you but even though there is a lot of darkness in this moment there is also this cauldron of interesting stuff happening 
And I tend to go back to uh, what Bob Dylan says in the times they are changing. And of course, he was talking about the 60s, but I think it's these times are changing very much too. And he says, you know, the the don't speak too soon because the wheel's still in spin and it's no telling who that it's naming. We're in a place where we're not there wherever we're going yet. And the good news is many people, from my perspective, many people are considering the existence of God and the meaning of Christ who wouldn't have. You know, so whether it's through Orthodox or through Paul Vanderclay or, you know, if, if some people have said I've helped them, whatever. You know, these are good things. You know, I am seeing Catholics, like Michael Knowles is a Catholic. I am seeing, you know, uh, people from different traditions. I am. See- it's just like I say, it's a, there's a lot of different people who are asking. They're, they're going back and forth. Not all the conversations are going to be appealed to everybody. But nevertheless, it's better than having no conversation. And no conversation is what the Hydra wants. Mm-hmm. It essentially wants uniformity. You know, that we all just simply agree to the new world, the new evolution. We've arrived. If we could just all do it. <laughs> so, yeah. But no, I do see hope. There's always hope. It's not hope for the masses. It's just hope that in this, some people will be able to find, uh, well, the way back home. Sure. And that's the anadromous life. That, that, was, that was a perfect closing line. Well, uh, it was really good talking with you, Bernie. I really okay. appreciate your time. Well, maybe uh, in several months down the road, we'll do it again if you have another burning set of questions. So. All right. That sounds great. Okay. Take care. So there you have it. Confessions of a Jesus person. Uh, not Jesus freak. We didn't like the phrase Jesus freak. I don't care what anyone says. Our group did not like being called Jesus freaks. But anyway, so there you go. And my feeling is that while that era is totally unrepeatable, it is nevertheless worth knowing about. And certain things that are part of the Christian landscape today come from that period. So I hope that was educational for you and meaningful. And I'd like to thank Sam for getting in touch with me. Now, Paul Vanderclay has conversations all the time. I don't plan on having conversations all the time. You have to have a burning question that you think I might be able to help with and or else I'm I'm I will probably look for I will look for people I am interested in talking to. But um I'm not the person who wants to talk to a a whole lot of people. I just want to talk to people who have something to say. So I'm saying that just so I don't get a lot of people uh, saying, Bern, I want to talk, I want to talk, I want to talk. I think talking is great. I think Paul does an excellent job at this. But um, I'm a little bit more surgical in my approach. I want things that kind of stay with the pattern of this channel. So, maybe you do have something to say. If it's, if it's good enough, I'll talk. Uh, don't be surprised if I go like, eh, I don't know. So, you never know. Well, this is Burn in Tbilisi saying thanks for hanging out with me and with Sam. And I hope you have an interesting day, uh, an interesting life, a meaningful life. And remember, anadromous means swimming against the stream. And that's what I hope you do. In this day and age, going with the flow is probably the worst thing you can do. Any flow. You need to use your mind and raise questions and use your heart and try to have compassion for people. A people without without history is not not redeemed redeemed from time. For history is a pattern of timeless moments.